Welcome to today's Women at Ardent webinar. I'm Jesse Stidham. I'm the Manager of Talent and Organizational Development at Ardent Health. Um, our topic today is Navigating During Turbulent Times, where we are going to learn from Del Oliver and Susan Giordano. They're going to discuss their experience during the recent COVID-19 pandemic. Before we get started, we actually have a special guest on the line that is going to introduce why we're all here today, and maybe he'll share a little bit about why this program is important to him. We've got Paul Kappelman, Chief Operating Officer and Arden's Interim CEO. So hi, Paul, welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? See me okay? Yes, we can. All right, well, I'm excited to be here. Um, Jesse, thank you for allowing me um, to free manage just to kick off and to um, say why it's important to me. Um, Jess asked to give a few thoughts about leading during turbulent times and, and women leaders and, and, and women in my life who led during turbulent times and how that impacted me. But first, I want to start with the mission. Um, the mission of Women at Arden is aimed at elevating women within our company by providing opportunities and resources to increase their visibility while developing leadership skills that further enhance the network of women at Arden. So just a, a, a little bit of facts about me and I, I think can help you understand and uh, what shaped me as a, as a person and as a leader. And I, I thought of two things when, when Jess and I talked. Um, the first is just um, the people that influence your life and, and oftentimes uh, for many of us, uh, that, that's your parents and, and for me, uh, my mom. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was three and a half years old and we were in New Orleans and my mom and I packed up and moved back to Baltimore. Um, and she, she raised me as a, a single mom, um, working oftentimes two jobs, and um, just was that person who was always there for me when times are good and when times are bad. And so, uh, like many of us, when we think about influential people in our lives, we think about our moms. So, just a little window into, you know, my view of, of, of strong uh, females and strong uh, female leaders. The other piece, when I think back at my career, and I think about my learning experiences and um, what shaped me um, so many times, as you know, as that assistant administrator and even as that chief operating officer, um, your, your work with that chief nursing officer uh, is so incredibly critical. And I was, I was blessed to have um, some really strong um, women chief nursing officers in my career who took me under their wing. Uh, and, and taught me a little bit, just a little bit, about uh, the clinical side of hospital management. And to me, I think that made me just a stronger leader. And watching them uh, manage through stress and just keeping calm, having that presence about them, uh, influenced me. Uh, so when I did get my first CEO job, even then, um, I always uh, just felt like having that calm, strong leader uh, by my side was critical. So. Thank you uh, for, uh, for having me, uh, Dell and Sue. Um, you are leaders that I admire and respect and have come to love. So thank you for doing this today and taking your time. And I really look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Paul, for sharing with us. Um, so guys, before we get started, I have a few um, housekeeping notes uh, before we get into our discussion with Sue and Dell. Uh, first, the lines are muted during this webinar. So if you have questions, we encourage you to send them in using the chat functionality throughout the presentation. The discussion today is gonna last for about 30 minutes and then we're gonna have about 15 minutes at the end for questions. We will also be recording this presentation and sending it out after the webinar. And since we do have multiple speakers talking throughout the presentation, uh, we recommend that you click on active speaker and thumbnail view so that you can see all the presenters. There won't be any slides that'll be shown during the presentation and dis or during the discussion today. For updates, please visit our website at ardenthealth.com slash women, or you can text the word women to the number 95159. If you do have questions, you can always email us at women at ardenthealth.com. And also we encourage you to take a selfie of you or your group, of course, physically distanced, um, and use the hashtag on social media, hashtag women, uh, ardent women. And then lastly, for each Women at Ardent webinar, our resource committee compiles a list of books, podcasts, and article recommendations that relate to our webinar topic. 
Uh, while these recommendations won't be specifically discussed today on the webinar, they are resources that can help create some more dialogue as well as provide some learning opportunities for you and your teams. So we encourage you to read them, listen to them, pass them along to your team members, and we'll also send these along with the web webinar recording after today's session. We always like to get started with a connect to purpose and for today's connect to purpose, we're going to recognize an ardent woman who has demonstrated amazing leadership and mentorship. We're recognizing Dr. Vesta Sandoval. She's the chief medical officer at Loveless Health System. Dr. Sandoval has had many roles during her time at Loveless, including chief of staff at Loveless Medical Center, chair of the ethics committee and chair and member of the critical care, stroke, peer review and credentials committees. She also served as the director of the intensive care unit, as well as the director of respiratory services for Loveless Westside Hospital, Loveless Women's Hospital, and Loveless Medical, Loveless Medical Center. So most recently, she has been instrumental in Loveless's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and has made the safety of our employees and patients a priority. She's a member of the state's COVID-19 task force and has been instrumental in the state's efforts to keep New Mexico residents informed, but also to be a resource for the regional hospitals to provide guidance and education and supplies in order to ensure that they can care for patients during this time. She also worked closely with other Loveless leadership to stand up the state's first COVID-19 drive-through testing, uh, which tested thousands of residents. She continues to work closely with the New Mexico Department of Health and the Centers of Disease Control to help keep employees and medical staff up to date on this ever-changing pandemic. Thank you to Dr. Sandoval for your dedication and work to provide care to our community while protecting our employees. So just a couple um, updates here before we get started. Our next webinar will be held in late August and it will be discussing the topic of unconscious bias. So stay tuned for an email or a text message inviting you to that webinar later this month. And then late last we did send out a survey to gauge your interest on various webinar topics, but since then the world has changed quite a lot. So we thought that it would be appropriate to ask for your opinions and thoughts again. So we're going to be sending out the survey along with all the resources and recorded webinar link via email after today's session. So if you could take the time to complete the survey, which would take just about two to three minutes, we would greatly appreciate it. And as always, thank you so much for your interest in and your support of this Women at Arden program. Now it is time to meet our wonderful speakers and our moderator that are going to share some amazing perspective with you today. Our speakers are Del Oliver. She's the Chief Nursing Officer at Mountainside Medical Center and Susan Giordano, CNO at Pascac Valley. Del began working at Mountainside Medical Center in 2018 as the Chief Nursing Officer, managing all nursing operations for the 365 bed community hospital. Prior to becoming the Chief Nursing Officer at Mountainside, Dell worked as the AVP of Nursing Leadership and the AVP of Executive Development at HCA. Most recently, Dell was named Chair of the Ardent Diversity Council. She's contributed to the formation of a diversity program for one of the nation's largest healthcare providers. Dell earned her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from the University of Alabama and later earned her Master's of Business Administration and Healthcare Management and Master's of Science in Nursing degrees from the University of Phoenix. She is also a fellow with the American College of Healthcare Executives and maintains her nursing license in Tennessee, Florida, and New Jersey. Susan Giordano is the Chief Nursing Officer at Hackensack Meridian Pascac Valley Medical Center. In her current role, she's responsible for the effective leadership of the organization overseeing all clinical nursing units, as well as organizational education and the pharmacy. Susan joined Pascac Valley in 2013 and helped lay the successful groundwork to reopen the facility in 2013. At Pascac Valley Medical Center, she has been a part of the successful implementation of the EPIC EMR, introduction, introduction of the nurse residency program, as well as oversight of the new emergency department construction project and numerous joint commission certifications. She has spent the majority of her career with Hackensack Med Meridian Health, including 22 years at Hackensack University Medical Center in various roles, including Administrative Director of Surgical Services and Administrator of Capacity Management. Our moderator today is Kiara Marabobble, Director of Marketing and Public Relations at Mountainside Medical Center and the Hospital Women at Art Representative. 
uh, Kiara joined the marketing and community health team at Mountainside as the marketing coordinator in 2011, functioning as the hospital's in-house graphic, graphic and web designer and community health educator. Her experience includes independent contracting for educational and nonprofit organizations, where she has provided copywriting, graphic design, and strategic planning services. Previously, she worked as a community health educator for Atlantic Health Services. Okay, ladies. Thank you so much for being here. I am going to turn it over to you. Jesse, thank you for the introduction. Um, the New Jersey market is very excited to be here with all of you to share some of our insights on navigating through COVID-19. Uh, with New Jersey's close proximity to New York City compounded by the fact that we are the most densely populated state in the country, things escalated very quickly here. And before we knew it, there didn't seem to be a single patient coming into our hospitals who was not a COVID patient. Mountainside diagnosed our first COVID-19 patient, positive patient on March 9th, and Pascat Valley followed shortly after on March 13th. And to date, the two hospitals combined have tested over 5,000 um, people for COVID-19. Uh, during the search, there was tremendous strain on our resources, like staffing, PPE, ventilators, and so little was known about the virus that the lessons learned here were really instrumental in helping to write the COVID-19 playbook for our organization. Many of your hospitals came to our aid with supplies, staff, and encouragement by way of letters, snacks, and all things which our team members were so very grateful for. And today, Sue and Dell will share some of their insights about coping, leadership, and how the pandemic has helped them to evolve, not just as leaders, but also as people. Um, if you have any questions during the conversation, please feel free to type them into the chat function and we'll do our best to answer them during the call. Um, so let's get started. We heard a lot in the media that COVID-19 has been taking an emotional toll on people from all walks of life. Dell, I'll start with you for this first question. Can you share how you felt emotionally during this time and how did you cope with everything that was going on? Yes, thank you, Kara. Thanks for the introduction as well to uh, Jessica. So the, the very first emotion once it uh, was, was extremely fearful at times. Um, and I, that, was, that was a strong emotion simply because we didn't, it was the unknown, not knowing anything about this disease. Um, and we had had um, exposure. Positive patients had been exposed to our staff unknowingly. Patients had unknown that, and our staff didn't know that. And that created even more fear because we had to have several of our staff members quarantine at the beginning of this as well, not certain if they were going to become ill or succumb to the disease as well as what we've seen so far. Um, and then also not sure that um, if they'd be able to return to work and what was going to happen next. That probably created the most fear that I've had for a very long time because in the beginning it affected a lot of my staff who were also fearful. There wasn't anything I could do about it. I could not fix it. Sue, do you have anything to add? Yes, hi. So um, we just experienced, there was a wide range of emotions throughout this whole experience. And as Dell said, I think the greatest was definitely the fear of the unknown. Um, but on top of that, I think there was just a lot of worry. There was worry about the safety of our staff. There was personal worry about yourself and your family. Um, I think it was really important as a leadership team that we supported each other and everybody had their moment and we were there to support each other through, um, through that time. Most important was really just keeping open communication because things were just changing rapidly. It was the start of the COVID pandemic in the States and there was just so much unknown that it was in a daily basis, we were changing thoughts and ideas based on information that was coming in. I think we had to be very aware of emotional and mental exhaustion and it was important to make sure we had schedules and time off because everybody just never felt that they could leave and we had to really enforce and say, you have to separate and go home and maintain a schedule 24 seven around the clock to make sure everybody had that time off to regroup and come back. Um, to cope with that, I think personally for both work and home, there was a lot of self-reflection um, that I practiced and being aware of where my feelings were, what I needed to do, who I needed to talk to, how, how to manage through that. And I think for my colleagues and our staff and our providers and our patients, it was really being present and being there and understanding them as a 
full person and individual because again there was just so much in everybody's head and just um, a lot of fear and emotion at that time. You bring up fear, Sue. So when this all began, I remember that I wasn't really starting to feel scared until about two weeks after the first case hit our our market, and we were really in the thick of things. I was afraid that you know I might bring the virus home to my family, that I might get somebody sick. Did you have any new fears when this began? And if so, how did you deal with them? Again, I think there were just so many areas that we did not have a handle on initially, whether that was supply and equipment or staff, the volume of patients, what was the treatment plan? How do we manage these patients? And everybody's safety was our responsibility. I think the biggest um, fear or emotion too that we were dealing with, it, it was just heartbreaking. There was isolation everywhere. People were isolating themselves at home as caregivers. Patients were coming in without families. Um, it was really, just a very um, uncanny time that that was very difficult to manage through. I think for me personally, my turning point was when our physicians, our ED providers and our medical providers started to express their own personal fears as we got one or two weeks into it and the volume kept growing. And no matter what we were doing, the patients were just turning on a dime and getting sicker and we were running out of space. And I, I think when our physicians started to show doubt and fear, that's when, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it personally hit myself. Um, it was really to get through it. It was keeping ourselves educated, resorting back to your HRO principles and safety and turfing to the experts um, and just supporting ourselves with our joint venture partners. We had Hackensack Meridian Health, which was in the thick of it with us in New Jersey, dealing with it real time. And we also had um, the expertise of the Arden um, part of our network that could support us with supplies and staff because it wasn't hitting in all the areas where the Arden facilities were. So I think just staying up to date and educated and communicating out was how we managed to get through the fear. How about you, Dell? Did you have any new fears when this started? I think uh, to add a little to Sue, the added fear was if staff was going to be able to come back and if we were going to have enough staff. I remember early on, I know Paul's on the call, I remember we had one of those tough sessions where you know, we reached out to the division and to corporate to ask for more staff and the fear that we would have these sick patients that needed and required a lot of care and might not actually have the caregivers to deliver on. And I'd have to say, like Sue said, I mean, Ardent came through with, um, Oh, between the two of us, I know we had about 100, probably close to that, with uh, Pascal Valley of staff that came in for our sister hospitals. Uh, that's, that's the thing that really quenched the fear because you just never know. Day, it was day to day whether we were going to, how we were going to survive this horrible, horrible situation. And um, we, we did. It, it, overcame, it overcame itself with, with the help. Um, the, the, pand the pandemic required a lot of us to restructure our work days. Um, you know, more often than not, we found ourselves spending long hours working at the hospital, and when we were at home, we were working from home. Um, how did you decompress, Dell, at, after all of the emotional turmoil and long hours? Um, I, I, I set up some routines. That, what, that was one thing that was important. And, and myself, I found myself really not watching much media that was structured. I didn't watch any of the news uh, that much except the, uh, the COVID updates. That was helpful because it was just a lot of, of stress and a lot of pressure. I ended up resorting to some of the simple, very simple TV shows that I enjoyed that required really no thought. I mean, like Gilligan's Island, I watched that quite a bit. Um, because it, was, it was quite, it was humorous. Comedy and humor helped me, helped me decompress quite a bit. Um, I didn't have family here. My husband was here. I sent him back home to stay so and to not have my, my family or anyone else here that could be possibly infected. That, that helped a lot to decompress. Uh, one of the other things we have is an inpatient psych unit, and our leaders in our inpatient psych unit also helped us de decompress. They made rounds. They gave out stress balls and, you know, things that you think weren't important before became very, very important now. And that actually just having some stress balls during the day 
to kind of help you decompress a little bit. And mindfulness is what one of our psychiatric nurses came around with. And so a 10-minute 10, 10 session that she would have on the unit for people to kind of take it down a notch. And that really helped. Those 10 minutes were probably the most valuable 10 minutes on the unit that uh, some of the staff went through. Do you have anything to add, Sue? Yeah, I, I think um, as Dell mentioned, it was definitely from the beginning putting together a structure and a routine and making sure you adhered to that, whether at work or personally at home. For me, um, my family was of huge importance. I have a son who was home, I had my parents, my sisters, and not being able with my sisters to see them in person, we, we committed and had frequent phone calls, relied on FaceTime, um, and really throughout the, the entire um, crisis in New Jersey, it was always keeping yourself looking at the positives and sharing um, the happy moments. And there were simple things. I would get home from work. I woke up one morning, I looked out my window and my niece in the middle of the night came and chalked up the driveway and just put, we love you. You know, nurses are the best and had flowers and rainbows. Um, my neighbors, I came home from work one day, they put a, a lawn sign on the front of my house that just said, thank you. We appreciate um, healthcare workers. It was just um, all of those personal touches and bringing back that humanity and for our staff and providers here, I think the community support was just invaluable um, from food to parades to personal handwritten thank you notes from children, from brownie troops. It, it didn't matter. It poured in on a daily basis and we, we did a great job daily of just taking that up and sharing it out in the departments with everybody. It didn't matter whether you were in the clinical or in the financial or medical records, we took everything from the community and, and brought that to the staff. And I think that's what kept us going on a daily basis. So you mentioned decision-making earlier. Um, during turbulent times, we do need to think quickly, but also thoughtfully so that we can make the best decisions for our organization and for our team members. How do you think your decision-making changed or altered during COVID-19? Uh, you know, I think the, the first immediate thing that comes to mind is that formal structure and hierarchy was just out the window. You had to make real-time immediate decisions with the focus on an attention to safety. And again, I, I, I really believe that our HRO training just became second nature during all of this. And it was relying on the expert being preoccupied with failure, um, being inclusive. We had to be out in the, with the front lines on a regular basis, frequently rounding just to listen and hear and understand what was not working, what did we need to fix and get their ideas. And they were really creative and out of the box solutions to a lot of our problems that we were facing at that time. And it was for us, hearing what they had to say, hearing what they thought the solution was, and then we would pull all the resources together, get that implemented and get it done um, quickly. And I, again, it was always just thinking through to make sure what we were doing wasn't gonna create some kind of an unsafe environment unintentionally. You still had to take that pause and think through it, but it was definitely um, just reacting in a, in a very rapidly changing environment. How about you? I think one of the things that I know from a decision making standpoint that we did as a team that was really, really important and was really helpful. No one did Monday morning quarterback. A decision was made, it was made then, we followed through, and we didn't go back, doubt, and question our decisions at that particular time. Decisions were made with the information we had, and we moved forward with it. And we were able to delegate to, and no one could do it all. You know, as nurses, oftentimes, we get to where we can put all, manage it all, and make those decisions. And there were so many decisions to be made that our, our team gelled together and, uh, and we made those decisions. Because that, the decisions um, and making decisions like that will, required a lot of support on the team. And that was one of the things that helped with our decision that we knew that we checked in with each other. But when a decision was made, I make it, the CFO made it. I mean, literally, I, I probably converted our senior team into animal nurses 
so we could all make nursing decisions, and that was very positive for us. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your leadership style and how you think they changed or evolved during COVID-19. Um, Del, we'll start with you first, and then Sue, you can respond after. Uh, do you think your leadership changed in any way, or did, do you think that your current style worked? I think my current style worked, and I always pride myself and speak of myself and learn that even in nursing school, and, and I'm hardwired as a transformational leader. I believe in my relationships with my staff. Communication is really, really important. And if you communicate, you build relationships, you will build trust. And people will do for you, do with you, and help you, and vice versa when it comes down to you being a good leader. And I think of a leader of influence because we had to have staff that would believe in us. And uh, part of what we did over time throughout COVID, too, in that, in that moment of being leaders is believe in our staff, uh, even in the worst time. I know... Several times had, had gone by in which um, staff was calling out. And one of the things that I shared previously with others that I started taking all the sick calls for the organization um, and just to be there with them when people called in because they were fearful, fearful of coming to work, fearful of their family or, or whatever reason. And I think part of my leadership skills and style was to communicate then at any time. And, that, and I have a very open, very approachable style. And, that was helpful to me. Um, there was no fear of intimidation with staff that I was aware of that, that really helped us through it. So um, to follow up with Dell, I, I do believe that um, my leadership style probably evolved during um, this crisis. I think the key driver for me was really focusing on that human and personal connection with all of our staff and team members and providers, it was taking the time to understand where they were emotionally, um, whether at home or at work and what they were bringing with them when they were here working in this environment. It was highly charged. It was emotionally driven. And as leaders, we really needed to keep that focus and structure to bring calmness to a chaotic environment. Um, personally, for me, I think the hardest part was as a, a nurse by profession and just being in the healthcare business, um, we lost the humanity during all of this. It was isolation, it was closed doors, it was masks, gowns, goggles, face shields. Um, there was no human touch, there was no personal connection. It was very difficult to maintain that. And I think for our staff and myself, that was the hardest part to think through and try to bring some kind of sensibility to that. It it's just goes against everything that's at our core. Um, so again, to, to help through that, it was really just listening, being supportive, being present, never lo losing focus on safety. And I think as a leadership team, we really united and became supportive and were very inclusive throughout the entire crisis to, again, just move the team through something that was just so unprecedented. Times have been really busy at the hospital since the start of the pandemic. So, Sue, can you share anything new that Pascal Valley has done to recognize your team members? So, during the crisis, I think it was really, again, being present in the departments on the unit, that personal one-on-one -on -one recognition, thanking them, understanding where they were coming from, what their personal struggles were, how we could help them both at home and at work. Um, for us in New Jersey, it had it actually fell during hospital week and nurses week. And that was a diff difficult decision as a leadership team to, to figure out how we wanted to manage that. And I think we really found a nice balance with it. Um, we did do team and staff awards. We did them out in the parking lot. We had local community leaders. We had our board here um, and staff felt recognized and um, went a long way with that. We had a local parish priest bless oil and we went around and did a healing hand ceremony um, where we blessed the hands of the, of the caregivers. Um, and then for me personally, the event that I liked the best was um, we dedicated a garden and unveiled the Healer's Touch statue, which comes from the Daisy Award program. 
um, in recognition of the year of the nurse, which will be a permanent garden, a permanent statue out in front of the organization, um, always as a remembrance and leading up to that event, we gave out rocks and, and paints and people would painted rocks with an emotion, a person's name, a thought, um, something that they, and when we had the ceremony, they brought the rocks and the rocks are displayed um, around the statue and it's just beautiful. Again, I have to say that the community support and recognition was beyond one's expectation. Um, there were so many tears of mixed emotion, but it really united us as a team and as a community. Gail, if you have any, anything to add? Yeah, I add a little bit to that too, because who covered it really well. We some of the same things mirror over here at Mountainside uh, as far as recognition with Hospital Week and Nurses Week. And because our community partners were able to donate items too, that was very helpful that we were able to recognize staff with just the very little things. I mean, shoes, socks, like she said, the gowns and masks and different things they were making at home. But also, we had a daily briefing that we communicated out to staff at literally every day, and we tried to recognize a staff member in the daily briefing because everyone was going to be going over and beyond. And when that was mentioned, um, we, we took special time to write up a little something and uh, put it in our daily briefing. And, and obviously our parades around the hospital, local community fire department and sheriff department and police department was recognition for, for us. It, it was a real good feel time. We missed hugging. I missed that. I'm a very physical contact person. So I, I missed hugging. We resorted to a lot of elbow bumping, a lot of fist bumping, you know, backside bumping, like we, a few people call booty bumping or whatever. But we really, we really missed that. We can't wait till we get back, back, back to that part. But that's, that's recognition. <laughs> and Del, now that things have calmed down a little bit, knock on wood as I say that, um, and you've had time to really reflect, what is something you've discovered um, during our, the pandemic that has been really meaningful for you? Um, I discovered, although I knew we had a very close team, a leadership team, but when that was put, COVID put that to the test. And one thing I did discover was that there's it's literally an unbreakable bond with our leadership team. I mean, we were always professional and we cared about each other, but the deepness that we experienced was caring for each other, caring for our family, made sure you know, each other looked out for each other, had some time away. That was one thing that I, I would think that was, was, was real eye-opening. Not that it wasn't there, but just the general deep caring I mean, for, for each other was really, really strong. And it was a single unit. We, we were one as, as a leadership team in our hospital became one as an organization. And how about for you, Sue, anything meaningful that you've learned? Yeah, I think that throughout the chaos and the sadness, there were many bright spots and, and positive things that emerged that you had to pay attention and acknowledge and, and understand. Um, one, I think just as a healthcare community, um, information flowed rapidly, and for the first time, all of our competitors in our local market, we were on daily phone calls sharing experience, sharing equipment, sharing treatment plans. Um, it really united the healthcare community, and for our, our patients and families and, and those living out there, I think that was a really positive thing. We, we all came together. I think emotionally, the sense of family and community really pulled us through. It was a, a life-changing experience that just brought personally to me a higher sense of connectedness with people as individuals, and that has changed me forever. Um, it purely was about your heart and caring for others, and that was at the core of it, and that's how we, what I relied on to survive and get through that chaotic time. Yes, yeah, that's great. And then my last question before we open it up to questions from our participants. Um, we'll start with you, Sue. What is something that you didn't do before, either at work or in your own personal life, that you will continue to do now as we move forward? Again, I, I go back to that personal connection, and that can be both at work and at home. It's taking that, that time, and you call it extra time, but it's really not extra and being present and understanding personally that individual, not the nurse, the unit clerk, the physician, but the person, 
the same with family. It's not just your mom. She's a, a whole person. My son is just not my son. He's a whole person. And I think through all of this and even now in the aftermath and trying to negotiate into our new new lifestyle and, and normalcy, um, that that personal connection, I think, um, is something that I'm focused on and will continue to do now that we move forward. That's beautiful. How about for you, Dell? Anything? I'd say probably the most fun comment is um, taking things for granted, taking relationships for granted. I mean, oftentimes, you know, I may talk to family a couple of times a week, sometimes maybe not as much, friends, uh, staff members here. But um, like I mentioned before, you know, not taking for granted is something that that's near and dear. Spending a lot more time with connections. People that I had connected with for years, I found myself connecting with. I knew they were there, but I connected with them uh, quite a bit. That was that was really really important to me, and that that was important to them also because family, friends, staff members also wanted to know how you were doing, how I was doing through it all, and that made that gave them a sense of, of being a part of my life through through this whole pandemic. That was um that was important, and I think the last thing that I would add too, in addition to that staying in touch with your family and friends, but also with staff. And like I took sick calls, but that gave me another level of connection. And will I do it again? Absolutely. Connections I made at, at, in the wee hours of night when people were calling because they were afraid to come to work and negotiating some time for people to come to work if they couldn't do the whole shift because they had babysitter issues, transportation issues, um, that I would, I would do it in a heartbeat. Never thought I would get that much reward out of um, doing sick calls for staff, you know, kind of functioning as a supervisor on the nighttime was something that um, I learned a lot and appreciate. Thank you for answering my questions. And now we will open it up to questions from the group. Again, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat function. Um, so let's start with, did you see any frontline staff leaders um, or any frontline staff emerge as leaders through the high points of the pandemic? And if so, have they continued to demonstrate this leadership? I'll start with you, Dell, because I know we've seen it here. Yes, we have. So, so part of the, the, when the pandemic hit, one of the things that we know is because we had to close down or census reduced several of our departments. Now, OR department was probably the biggest department that we had to, to figure out how to redeploy staff. And out of that OR department, one of the things that's come out of that is, is now currently an infection control nurse who is an OR nurse. So in redeploying, we redeployed throughout our organization almost 100 nurses between several departments that we've seen people step up with some of our OR nurses. Wound care nurses work as supervisors, so they're still doing interim supervision now, as well as um, the infection control one that I mentioned. And some are interested in leadership, and also uh, a couple of them have re-enrolled since we got the ardent discount for education, have re-enrolled in school. Oh, that's great. I didn't know that. How about for you, Sue? Anything at Pascal Valley you want to point out? Yeah, again, it was in all areas. Um, different leaders did emerge um, for different, for a variety of different topics. If you look at the clinical areas, um, as the patients and our volume kept growing at, we quickly divided and had a COVID unit and a non-COVID unit. And of course, there were a lot of fear and anxiety of working on the 100% pure COVID unit. And we had a couple of nurses that, that immediately said, staff me there and staff me there the entire time because that's where my calling is, that's where I need to be. And um, committed themselves up to that area and helped mentor colleagues through working in that environment. Um, I think we had a lot of leadership um, arise in our um, plan ops department. There were so many things that needed to be done immediately and out of the box with the physical environment, barriers, um, IV poles, you name it. There were a million things that had to be done and that, that team really rose to the occasion and what can I do to help you? Just tell me what the idea is. I don't need any more detail. I'll go figure it out. Come back, present you the plan and get it done. Um, and I think in our support services, everybody took on new roles and a lot of 
people wanted to help that may not have been clinical, but did come and offer their support in a variety of different ways. And again, I, I think those people continue in that role and gave us firsthand knowledge. I think some leaders arose outside of our immediate staff. And I, I think of some of the staff that flew here from the other audit facilities that really took leadership positions by choosing to come here and have gone back. And I think our stellar employees there, I, I, I know Travis has had a lot of attention, but he was a superstar when he was here. And, and I see a lot of continuing um, pieces of information and interviews with him as well um, now that he's back home. That actually segues perfectly into the next question from our group. Um, what was it like to have the ardent nurses helping out your facility? I can share with you. I think they were a great, great um, positive influence and had a very positive impact on our staff. Our staff were just caught and in it and to have nurses and respiratory therapists make a personal choice decision to fly here and assist and jump right in i really went miles for us in in as far as um elevation of mood and the environment they were so thoughtful so caring and once they got here the vast majority of them extended their stay and were willing to stay on and help and i think a lot of our staff i see on facebook everybody's still connected and sharing stories and sharing experiences so I think that was a really big win. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, Joe? Yes, I would. Number one thing I'll add to that is ethics. Staff came in and they knew ethics. That it wasn't any type of, of, of extreme onboarding. Access was granted extremely quickly. That, that made a difference. And knowing somebody could start documenting right at the moment that they came in. Some staff didn't even use the rest day. They started started uh, working right after they got off the flight. Several of them did, and it just so happened uh, this this week, I actually saw a uh, requisition for an employee and one of the staff members who worked here during the pandemic uh, is going to move to New Jersey and work here as an employee. So I, I will be teaming up and getting with that CNO and um, asking for forgiveness. Um, and do you think that there is any? What kind of changes there will be in healthcare because of the pandemic? Oh, I think a lot. I think it's, it's, it's made us smarter healthcare workers um, because COVID caught us off guard in so many ways from an equipment standpoint, a manpower staffing standpoint, um, even a, an ability to gather supply standpoint. So to now know, and we're all kind of anticipating a second wave, so to speak, not sure if it will get here. But I think we're better prepared now than we ever have been based on what we went through previously. Yeah, I, I would just add that I think it, it definitely made it more efficient. Um, I think it is definitely blossomed and is here to stay, the telehealth. I think it's permanently going to have an impact on how our emergency departments are going to function. Um, there are a lot of different opportunities and avenues that were created during this time for patients to seek that urgent care kind of help that our EDs had been using. Um, so our volumes are down, but the acuity is up. And I, I just think it made us smarter and more efficient, but by far there are gonna be long-term impact on the healthcare environment in many ways. And I just saw um, a question come through about communications, how quickly and how important was it to get communications out? Um, I can speak for Mountainside and Dell and Sue, please feel free to answer that it was really, really very important for us to get communications out every single day, you know, to have a single source of truth for everything that's changing, everything that's happened. Um, how difficult was it to get it out? At first, it was a little bit difficult since there were so many things going on, but really getting your leadership on board and your team members on board with reading this, um, this single source of truth, right? That's what I like to call it. Um, was really, really beneficial beneficial for us. Um, if you would agree, or if you have anything to add, Stuart Dell. 
Yeah, I would say there was a variety of ways that we had to communicate because things could change multiple times in one day. And I, I kind of think about PPE that was changing constantly based off of what we were learning as well as what was available. Um, so I think we turned to a lot of variety, uh, a different variety of ways to communicate. Much of it was just in person, real time, constantly out and rounding. Here's the message, leadership, go out, let's round and, and individually get staff. We did huddles, we did webinars, um, we did the formal written communication from the CEO at the end of every single day. But I think most important was that personal individual communication. Um, Cause like you said, there was rapid, rapid fire things coming through. And by the time somebody read an email, there may have been three more emails after that, that had new things about the same topic. So it was definitely real time. And a lot of that has stuck with us um, now that we're post the, the pandemic crisis here and we're sticking with the huddles and we're sticking with the webinars with the leadership team on a regular basis. Um, more inclusive and in how the leaders then go back to their staff real time and safety huddle and update them on a daily basis. Uh, and the thing I would add to that is flexibility and adaptability. The staff knew, I mean, because the media was saturated also, because you had federal level, state level, community level, and as well as internal hospital level of communication. But our staff knew that it was rapid, like Sue said, rapid fire. So today it was PPE and goggles. Tomorrow it was maybe mask and hair nets. And the next day it may be foot covers. But we got it out every day. And it wasn't a lot of editing. And it wasn't a lot of proofreading. It didn't have to go through several channels to get the communication out. As a one team, we all agreed this would need to go out. If it changed tomorrow, it changed tomorrow. And if it changed the next day, but getting it out by the end of the day. And then one thing I'd add to like Kara mentioned is having marketing people there. They're the ones who become the source of communication because you got emails with Sue and I being in a joint venture hospital between two great organizations. Not only were we trying to communicate information that we were getting from Ardent, but we were also having communication and align information that we were also getting from a hacking site. And, and doing that double duty uh, create an opportunity for us to have almost the best of both worlds in communicating. Great. And I'm going to ask one more question so that we can wrap it up. Um, knowing what you know now, um, what would you have done differently or if anything at all? That's probably the hardest one you've answered so far. I know. <laughs> it, it wasn't my question. It was somebody else's. <laughs> Because everything was different that we did then. <laughs> and, and what I learned from, from that was different is okay. You know, change is okay. And changing on a moment's notice is okay. Normally, you know, when ideas probably in, the, in my past, ideas would come up, people would make suggestions, you kind of think about it. Uh, you probably develop a committee or a group or a steering group, and then you try to move the idea forward. But, um, but it was so many ideas and so much information that you changed then and every idea was important. Everything people said was important from staff level all the way up to leadership level. And that, knowing that, we can make decisions quicker, sooner, and not, not sit on things that were, were, were very important. Uh, the only other thing I can think of is we, we did it relatively soon in the process, but having a historian and being able to track and trend very timely and specifically, what did you know and what decisions did you make based on that knowledge? Because so many things evolved and then we'd be sitting at the end of the day and we're like, okay, we had an exposure that was back on this day. What was our PPE process at that time? What was the patient flow at that time? Where were the COVID patients at that time? and trying to stay organized. I think we learned quickly to get there, but we didn't have a process initially set up from the beginning that made that so easy. And just tracking and trending so many st stats throughout the day for different organizations, whether regulatory, for Arden, for Hackensack, for our own self, I think there was a lot of ancillary support that was needed to keep that command center going um, that 
it took us a little while to figure out and get there. And then we had to backtrack and try to piece things together and try to find emails and what was the communication and everybody was digging through piles of paper. And um, so I think trying to track and trend and log a timeline was was important right from, from the first day that it started. All right, thank you both for answering questions. I think that would wrap it up for questions for today. I'll turn it over to Jesse to close out. Awesome, awesome. Thank you guys so much for the um, wonderful information and all the insight and, and sharing that experience with us. We really appreciate your time today. Um, guys, just as a quick reminder, um, we have a few ways that you can continue to get information about the Women at Ardent program. So you can visit the website, you can text women to 95159, you can email us, um, and don't forget to share your images using the hashtag Ardent Women. And we really appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you on our next webinar late August. Look out for details coming soon. Thank you guys so much.